Good job remembering to record, Kate. Step one, record the meeting. Okay. I think we have a few more coming in. Okay, I think we have Libby here and um, she's going to give a welcome and then we have some administrative uh, stuff that needs to happen for quorum for crack and select board, but I'll have uh, Libby just give a welcome first. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. This process, as hopefully we all remember, began in February of 2021 with a goal for long-term planning for Baxter Road in the immediate area. This is our last stakeholder meeting um, in, the, in the process that was established. Previous meetings were in small groups. Today's meeting is the first time all 12 named stakeholders have participated together. We're going to be taken through a number of options today as outlined in the draft that was made it available to the stakeholders last Thursday. It's also on the, been on the town website since last Friday. Um, and we really encourage and hope and urge everyone to please be open-minded to a path forward. And I'm just hearing a bit of um, noise there. So people who are not muted, when you are not speaking, could you please mute? Otherwise, things get difficult and very distracting. Um, I think the... Um, our, can I, Libby, can, I, can I jump in? Whoever's the host, can we mute? Can you can the admin mute anybody who's not speaking? Thank you, Jason. I was just going to mention the same. Sorry, then I got muted. Um, th thank you very. Thank you, Jason. Um, I, Kate or. Jen or Vince, I think the idea here is to get stakeholder input, but not public comment for, for this session. Okay. And um, I think the next step is for the select board and the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee to call themselves to order. And then the project team, I think you guys will take us through the presentation. That's right. Correct. So, um... Jason, do you want to go first? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Kate. We'll call the select board meeting of uh, September 14th to order by roll call. Can you please state that you are here and you can hear us and try to find everybody? Uh, Don Holgate. I haven't heard you yet, Don. Are you there? I can't see everybody's. Matt Fee is here. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Christy, Christy Ferrantella? Here. And Melissa Murphy? Melissa is not here. Okay, and Don, I see, I see Don. She's there, Don's she's there. Here. All right, so we have a quorum. Then thank Mary? You. I'll go ahead and call to order the second meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee today. This is a 3.30 start for the Baxter Road project. Uh, uh, members, when you uh, hear your name, would you respond in the affirmative? Gary Beller? Present. Sarah Boyce? Here. Uh, I'm not sure if Peter Brace is able to join us at the moment. Uh, we'll come back, Peter, if you are. Matt Fee? Here. Ian Golding? Yes. Jen Carberg? Here. Chris McClure? Here. Uh, Joanna Roach? Here. And uh, Mary Longacre Chair. I think that's everyone. So I think we're going to get the presentation up on the screen. Um, and it'll be sort of similar format. We're going to try and run through some of the, the uh, slides quickly and then leave plenty of time for discussion. 
So go ahead, Jen. Super, thank you. Welcome everyone and good afternoon. As Libby just said, this is our last group meeting uh, with all the stakeholders to discuss the draft memo on the project, which you've had a few days to look at. And I know we are all working hard to accelerate the final findings from our work. Thank you for coming. Today's speakers will be myself. I'm Jennifer Kelly Lockmeyer, the project director and contract officer from Arcadis for this assignment. I'm also the New England area leader for Arcadis Water Business Line in North America, and I have over 35 years of environmental engineering experience. Kate Edwards will be speaking as well. She's our project manager, and Kate is a professional engineer and has over 17 years experience in consensus building and reaching adaptive solutions to complex environmental problems. We'll also have Dr. Karen Bolter. She is an urban and coastal resiliency expert who has a PhD in geosciences, that's geology and geography. Her GIS spatial analysis of people, cities, and the environment inform data-driven climate resilience. She has worked as a professor and as a planner in local government, giving her a unique range of perspectives. Dr. Bolter also specializes in quantifying benefits and costs for pre-disaster mitigation and grant application development to support funding infrastructure resilience. Those are the speakers for today. Next, we'll show our discussion topics for today. So as we said, um, here is the agenda. Um, and you know that we did just recently submit the draft report. And the point of today's meeting is to have discussions around the recommendations and to further expand on the tipping points for moving forward with adaptation. We will discuss more details about retreat. And we know retreat is hard. We also know that it is inevitable. And again, we want to acknowledge all the hard work that has been done by you. You've been working as a community for over a decade on this. One of the common points all groups can agree on is that you love the island and you cherish the scenic walk along Baxter Road to the lighthouse and beaches. So today we continue our conversation around reaching consensus, the path forward based on technically feasible alternatives. Next slide, Karen. These are just the ground rules. I know you've seen these in all the other meetings. Um, the important point for today is that uh, we have invited the public to listen. Um, the, work the workshop format is what we will be doing uh, as we've done in the past. And the workshop format is only open to the participating stakeholder groups. So only those participants may provide verbal or written comments in the chat. So we ask that if you're just uh, if you're not in one of the stakeholder groups, just please uh, sit and listen and enjoy. Um, there'll be a different time for you to provide input. In addition, uh, we ask that the participating stakeholder groups uh, are the only people that respond to polls during the meeting. Uh, and just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded. This next slide shows the project mission. Um, this is the mission as defined by the stakeholder groups, um, and it had been adapted over time. And as we mentioned, the goal today is to discuss the short, mid, and long-term action plans. The next few slides I'm going to go through are going to briefly recap uh, where we are in the project, and then after that, uh, Kate and Karen will go into details in terms of uh, adaptation plans for short, mid, and long term. So this slide um, is really uh, very powerful and it, it shows you that by 2100, 70 homes are at risk. And those are the ones that are shown in blue. And this is by no means the worst case scenario, the 2100 being the yellow line that's shown there. And the reason we say it's, it's not the worst case scenario is because it's based on the 2012 NOAA intermediate high sea level rise projections, which project 4.1 feet mean, civil, mean sea level by 2100. More realistic projections are being used by the town and are close to double that. 
We also just want to reiterate that bluff erosion and collapse is the primary risk factor for Baxter Road structures, roadways, and utilities. So the current erosion protection methods along Baxter Road are sand nourishment, maintenance activities such as management of drainage, vegetation for bluff stabilization where the slope allows, sand filled jute fiber bags at the bluff's toe, and geotextile tubes called geotubes along a high port risk portion of the bluff. Note that none of the top four methods will prevent bluff collapse during or after an extreme storm event. As we mentioned before, we did have previous meetings in March, April, and June. And uh, the input from the stakeholder meetings did shape the recommendations in our memorandum, along with the paramount requirements of what is technically feasible. So I'll just um, read the goals that we had heard from these meetings. We incorporated the hard work done by your groups. We heard what is important to you and we weighed that as we considered the risks and feasibilities. We identified the common interests and goals. We identified solutions working around Sconset and other areas. And we identified what stakeholders need from the process to support the outcomes and we were seeking input on potential compromises. This slide is just a quick reminder of who the different uh, stakeholder groups are. We group them uh, and we'll be on the next slides, we'll talk about it by color. So you see the magenta group, the orange group, and the town group. The next slide, here shows you the, the summary of the public meetings where we came to the adaptation pathways that the groups were interested in. The Magenta group preferred geotube removal and planning for retreat as soon as possible. They were open to near shore breakwaters as a potential solution to reduce beach erosion. The orange group wanted to shift to adaptive dune nourishment and to expand the existing system. By 2050, they wanted to see nearshore breakwaters installed and to start planning a removal retreat and re road relocation, which would occur in 2070. The town's preferred pathway is to continue with adaptive nourishment with the existing systems in place while planning for implementation of retreat. So that's the overall summary of where the groups were. So the concerns that we have heard are shown here. There are challenges to the spectrum of stabilization alternatives due to concerns such as sand source and quality, aesthetics, beach access, potential environmental impacts, and unintended consequences such as sand migration, deposition, and downdrift erosion. Finally, as, as you all must know, in June, the CONCOM, um, the Nantucket Conservation Commission voted to remove the GO2 project after finding that the permit requirements were not being met, most recently for a lack of required sand nourishment. Removal of the current system and replacement with another form of tow stabilization will have environmental and cost impacts. It will take time for the system to establish a new dynamic equilibrium. If the geotubes are removed without any plan or protection in place, each violent storm will lead to further bluff collapse. Potential consequences will leave the town and the community exposed to a range of risks, including damage to roadways and utilities, emergency and public access limitations, and environmental impacts from damage to residential properties. It is likely that this removal decision will be appealed and, and efforts have been proposed to make up the sand shortfalls. 60 days for removal was issued last Thursday. 
So that's a brief synopsis of all the work we've done to date and where we are at. And now I'm going to turn it over to Karen, who's going to go into the alternatives a bit more. Thanks, Jen. And hey, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. I, I, all of these alternatives, we went over them during the last meeting. It's in the memo, but I just want to quickly review um, the, what, the key takeaways for the memo. Um, you know, the overall metrics that we use um, to protect, they were, they were around those functions of the existing beach and bluff. Um, we, we, <laughs> we looked at all these different ways to accomplish how to protect the bluff. And so the memo goes over examples and what, why they will or won't work. And so we looked at key questions to, to refine this toolkit and select alternatives of what would be most effective, but also feasible given the various constraints. So I just want to remind you guys that this alternative analysis was, um, you know, it, it was it was from an engineering and coastal process perspective, but also based on information gathered gathered from this stakeholder engagement. And this study is not a comprehensive study of the coastal processes in the area or an engineering study to design any intervention. So those are the limitations. Uh, one last caveat is that the the alternatives analysis assumed that the current system would come into compliance based on you know, the situation back then. So um, the next slide, we have a graphic kind of showing this distinction between the bluff stabilization and the toe stabilization. Um, it's, and it's, very, it's, it's, it's unique, this situation in Nantucket because of Nantucket's unique geology and coastal processes. But one thing is very clear, is that bluff protection can't be achieved without toe stabilization, as Jen said. So the alternatives that we looked at, they had to provide bluff, bluff protection, but also include toe stabilization. So we looked at other, uh, all kinds of forms of innovative protection measures, and some didn't provide toe stabilization. And so we didn't uh, look at those further. The toe is the foundation of the bluff, and that's where when the wave energy is attacking at the bluff base, if that toe gets eaten away, of course, everything above collapses. And um, you know, you need to have very large, large waves and high storm surge for the waves to reach the toe of the bluff. So toe protection needs to be designed for these infrequent larger storm events in order to be effective. Um, we really want to stress again, those two components we're talking about, bluff face erosion and toe erosion. So in the memo, we presented the background information on a range of important coastal processes, like the three listed here. So longshore transport is sediment migrating parallel to the shoreline. Cross shore transport is sediment moving per perpendicular to the shore. And then of course there's aeolian or wind transport, tra um, material transported by wind. And um, you can see in one of the mind maps from the memo that we looked at how each of the each protection measure being considered addressed each of these processes. For example, here the nearshore breakwaters in this mind map shows it was it, the the nearshore breakwaters was the only feasible alternative that worked with long short transport process. Um, the other examples included dew nourishment, which was feasible and working with um, to protect against cross shore transport. Uh, bluff stabilization was achieved through native vegetation and and different types of textile to protect um, to prevent the movement of sand by winds and sand fencing, which can help trap sands to build a fronting dune. So the bluff face again it can erode from wind, precipitation, stormwater, groundwater runoff, but that rate of erosion and the potential for the rapid bluff failure is significantly less. So the bluff face erosion does provide a sediment source for the beach system. So looking at all these things um, holistically, yeah, we made recommendations around the processes, which were maintenance measures, water management, slope management, best practices. You know, those are all in the memo, um, but that's not the primary driver that we're concerned about. Our, our, again, we just want to keep harping on this point because our main concern is an extreme storm event where the toe caves in and everything above collapses. So the critical part of all of this, you know, we, we gave a lot of background, but in the end of the day, the wave erosion at the toe is, is what we really are focused on. 
Um, so here's just some additional structures and tools that we presented in the memo. The groins and the berms were reviewed, but not recommended. Uh, the, the dune nourishment and sand fencing, we considered those, you know, they're frequently used to enhance sand accumulation, um, but the, the most effective configurations really vary among sites. So, um, you know, we, we did share at the last meeting that there were some surveys among residents and the community did respond very positively to fan, sand fencing along Baxter Road. So, you know, it's, it's not going to prevent against one of these extreme events, but, you know, it could, it, it does help. Sand fencing can help build dunes over time, stabilize material placed as dune nourishment, and it can supplement other recommendations for bluff stabilization and measures. So the next slide is really important because it's this, uh, this idea of magnitude and frequency is what we're talking about. There's, right, they say shocks and stressors. There's something that happens, you know, only once in a while, like very, very low frequency, but high, high, high intensity. And so, you know, this is something that we need to, these are the kind of events that we're looking at versus, then that's what's on the right um, of this spectrum that things like seawalls and revetments protect against. And the current protections are not there. The current protections, and this is why we're, we're like really trying to explain that these, these various protection measures, where they fit along the spectrum, they're not, the, the, the measures on the left side of the spectrum cannot hold up um, for, for these intense events. They're really more for these, you know, stressors that are, you know, wave energy every day, you know, the erosion that happens every day. That's, um, so we really, we need to kind of tease things apart in terms of, and, and that's why we use terms like re a return period, right? What's the hundred year return period is an intense event um, because it's a low probability of recurrence, but it's a high magnitude. So these catastrophic storm events are rare, um, but, and the versus those more frequent storms that don't do as much damage. So um, we're mo like I said, I just want to keep saying we're most concerned with the stronger storms eroding the bluff toe, causing rapid catastrophic bluff failure. So as such, our recommendations for toe stabilization measures are intended to address storms with higher water levels and larger waves. And by the way, the um, International Panel on Climate Change, who are recognized global leaders um, as a source for climate change information state that storm intensity and occurrence are expected to increase in response to climate change, seeing that's already happening. So, you know, it, sorry to be so repetitive, but we really want to drive these points home that there, you know, there's different types of events and we're looking at some of the worst case scenarios and there's a chance that will happen. Let's do what we can to protect from it because it could be really dangerous. Um, so la uh, lastly, I just want to review the five alternatives again um, and just remind you that this analysis was completed with the existing system in place for most alternatives with just a single variable changing over time. So here you could see the alternatives, how we described them and what the various coastal processes were. Um, so we went over these during the memo, during the last meeting, they're in the memo. Um, we, we really wanted to ensure that the alternatives considered um, and addressed the key tensions and needs related to the project. And if effectiveness were the only criteria, we would have recommended expanding the tow protection along more of the bluff. But we've listened to the feedback and the recent CONCOM vote shows that expansion is not feasible under the current situation. So for these reasons, um, the alternatives focused on these other recommendations, long-term removal and retreat with the exploration of interim measures to buy some time for the retreat process. So we'll, we'll share more on our recommendations later. And uh, I'll hand it over to, to Kate to talk about the criteria. Thanks. So yeah, actually, Karen just gave a really good um, introduction into this. Um, we don't look at just one thing for the evaluation criteria when we do an, um, an alternatives analysis. Um, if, if that were the case, um, 
many of us as engineers would just pick effectiveness. Um, but there's other things that go into that. So um, we look at what we've heard, what the local community knows, um, what you're experiencing on the ground, things like that. Um, so if we go to the next slide, These evaluation criteria really help us to select potentially feasible alternatives. Um, we look at a high level evaluation criteria, um, including uh, identifying the functional coastal processes, defining the environmental, ecological, and habitat considerations, and identifying cost, constructability, and structural considerations. Cost considerations were limited to an anticipated relative cost rather than cost estimates that you would um, get out of more advanced design stages. But this approach really helps us to identify the tools that could be adapted to the Baxter Road site and which options might be applicable. Um, all these tools and approaches were evaluated based on both the findings from the document review um, and our professional um, analysis and the stakeholder engagement process. Um, so if we go to the next piece, and I'll say that throughout the memo, um, a lot of these are shown as those mind maps, which can be read from left to right. And so as Karen was talking through that one, you could see and you can read them in the memo, kind of how things dropped off during that analysis process. Um, but for environmental considerations. We looked at the near shore cobble habitat and how thing, um, certain um, solutions could impact that. Um, promoting native vegetation uh, impacts, potential impacts or considerations around nesting birds. Uh, we know there's a public beach there and public beach access is important. Tourism and aesthetics and emergency access. And then for cost and structural considerations, we really looked at, you know, what does it take to install the solution? What does it take to um, operate the solution? Um, what are the considerations around maintenance of that alternative funding considerations, utilities and tax implications? And finally, once we have the tools selected through those mind maps, so the the alternatives that Karen outlined, right? Um, the four or five things that we came up with, we then put them against the criteria laid out in the scope of work. So we've narrowed down the universe of potential, potential solutions to those that are potentially feasible, given all the criteria we just stepped through. And then we can evaluate those selected alternatives um, against definition of purpose. Is it gonna do what we, um, what we need it to do? Is it going to last a long time? What's the service life? How much does it cost to put it in the ground? Um, what does it look like to operate and maintain the thing? Is it constructible? Um, is it permittable under the current regulatory scheme? Um, so, well, like we said, select a, selection of an effective strategy is really important. Other criteria like costs and regulatory considerations were really evaluated as well. And then I just want to hop to one of the um, other alternatives and just get into a little bit about the road. So if we go to the next slide. Previously studied and recommended was um, for the integrity of the roadway is likely to become compromised when the top of the bluff is within 25 feet of the roadway. It's important that the town has a shovel ready plan in place to address um, continued access, utility service, well before that 25 foot threshold is reached. So for the first time, I think ever, um, these measurements were shown in the memo. So you can see in the table, uh, the most recent measurement that was taken was in August of 2021. Um, we have at least one location that's already at 35 feet, but has been there since 2018. Uh, the map also indicated where those measurements are being taken from, where they're located along Baxter Road. So another thing we wanted to point out from the memo on the next slide is that 
relocation of the roadway, the last time we were together, <clears throat> we had shown you sort of what's shown here in blue in this phase one road relocation, potential conceptual road layout. It is not designed yet. Um, but in order to plan for a long term, all the way out to those 2100, that yellow FEMA line you see there. Um, we also looked at a phase two of moving the road and possibly where that could go. Um, the reason we did that is because we wanted to be able to provide a comprehensive concept to start working with. Um, and we think that moving the road and planning for moving the road is a very near term action, but could be done in phases. So phase one would address the most imminent danger um, and phase two would be a longer term possibility. If we go to the next slide, we did cost out um, the road relocation in phases as well. So for a total of 24.5 million, approximately mag order of magnitude, um, you could have the phase one and phase two uh, road relocation done. And then um, just wanted to touch on, because the last time we were together, we didn't really get to touch too much on the next piece, which is the impact to the tax base. Um, putting aside, which I know is important, but putting aside fluctuating um, property values, um, we looked at the 2020 property tax income, um, 74 million of which was from residential property taxes. Um, the, the homes that would be lost by 2100 add up to a total um, in 2020 tax revenue of $530,000 approximately. And that represents about less than 1%, 0.7% of the total residential tax income for 2020. So that's just, you know, it's just um, one snapshot in time and one metric to look at. Uh, we understand that there are others, but we wanted to kind of show this piece to you today as well. So the next piece I wanted to get into is a little bit about the adaptation pathways <clears throat> and talk about um, this very complicated and hard conversation that we're going to step into today, um, but to show you kind of one way that um, that it could be laid out here. So we'll go to the graphic, which I, I think the best way <clears throat> to look at this. We have the adaptation pathways. This is figure 34 in the memo. Um, they're split into this orange piece, which are the adaptation alternatives that we looked at um, in orange, which include the alternatives evaluated to slow the bluff erosion and maintain the beach. Um, and then the rec recommended short-term actions, which are shown in blue, and those center around planning for eventual retreat. Um, the retreat pieces begin to be shown in pink, um, and provisions for monitoring and maintenance are shown in gold with tipping points indicated by the scale, and these cautionary steps um, shown with this caution symbol. Um, you'll see that the, the recommended action um, really is if you pick, you know, either maintenance of the existing system or expansion of the existing system or near shore breakwaters, no matter what you pick, you will need to continue to monitor for changes in erosion. Um, if, if things are going okay and either you have a dynamic equilibrium or decreasing erosion, um, you just continue to monitor and understand you know, the impacts of the cost benefit of your maintenance. If there's increasing erosion, you have to look at that 25 foot mark from the bluff and understand how close you are. We really caution against removal of the system that's in place right now prior to um, a comprehensive retreat plan being in place. If for some reason that system gets taken out by a storm or by enforcement order, um, interim measures can be installed. Um, so sand dunes could be placed there um, with either sand fencing or plan 
planting, but it's really not going to provide the equivalent level of protection. The short term actions center around road relocation on one end and property retreat and relocation um, and the steps for funding and obtaining easements. Um, but immediate action recommended is to develop the concept design and final design for moving the road. Um, and when as soon as funding um, and plans are in place and all the easements and access, we, you would want to begin constructing the road. So I'm going to pass it off to Karen for the next piece. Thanks, Kate. And yeah, um, you know, we, we, we really want to get to the discussion. So we just have some final slides reiterating, um, you know, what we've been saying and um, the recommendations. You know, as Kate said, we're really stressing the dangers of removing the current system without another form of protection in place, because um, removing that the geotubes and um, even replacing them with another form of tow stabilization still is going to have environmental and cost impacts, takes time to establish a new dynamic equilibrium. And so in the meantime, the town and the community are, are exposed to this wide range of risks, including damage to roadways, utilities, emergency and public access limitations, and environmental impacts from damage to residential properties. So we, we, we think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to remove them, but we do think that once the, another system is in place and it's deemed safe to remove them, um, that's okay. So, um, you know, I think um, indefinitely, you know, that all the, the, the way we're looking at it, you know, the pathways, all the pathways, it just based on the data and the numbers, they lead to retreat. Um, indefinitely protecting the bluff from erosion is no longer a practical solution long term. Um, like we said, again, sorry to say it again, but if effectiveness were this only criteria, we would recommend expanding the geotubes, but it's at minimum, leave the existing system in place. Um, because in reality, you know, um, based on a number of factors, climate change, increasing construction and maintenance costs, regulatory policy, we cannot protect the bluff forever. It's not a practical solution. So just kind of this reality check that, okay, all roads lead to retreat, but if, we, if, if the community was open to expanding the geotubes, obviously it would buy more time. If the geotubes are removed haphazardly, it's very dangerous to the community and it will speed up the process of retreat and we might not be ready. Um, so leaving things exactly the way they are is kind of the middle point. And, and those are really, it seems like the, the three pathways that eventually get to retreat. It's just how fast can we get there? Um, so lastly, we're going to quickly go over the recommended action plan that we, we looked at in the memo and we divided the actions into three um, timeframes, which, you know, going in our pathways exercise, we looked at tipping points for 2030, 2050, 2070, 2100. Um, we talked about polling. We, we, in the polling, we talked about the dates for these things, um, but really these dates are not set in stone. We just need we, we're framing a conversation that, you know, after this slide, we really want to hand it over to a discussion and understand and get some realistic in point, in, input. So this is a starting point. Um, so for the, for the short-term actions, of course, and for all of the actions, just keep monitoring, keep seeing those distances to the bluff face. Um, and, and applying for funding is a really good short-term action. There's so much fu funding coming out with the infrastructure bill and for um, hazard mitigation for FEMA, you can apply for funding to move the road. So we can start looking at you know, the cost effectiveness and if it would um, qualify for some, some FEMA hazard mitigation um, funding. We have our documents on the BMP's best management practices. And of course, those are important for for maintenance, um, we 
we talked about near shore breakwater. Is it feasible? So doing a further study on understanding um, how feasible it could be in terms of logistics, risk reduction, cost, permitting. Uh, a lot of people were talking about a sediment budget uh, island-wide, and that's important, especially because of the, the tension of the sand sourcing. Uh, we do think that considering adaptive nourishment for the current system, you know, if, if, if we're saying it's failing because it's behind on sand, does it need that much sand? Like, let's look a little bit further. Um, and 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 lastly, you know, I think that this this conversation, this is a tough conversation, but um, there needs to be a comprehensive retreat plan, both for the public and the private property, because it needs to start happening, it needed to happen a long time ago, right? So let's start it at least today without, you know, arguing, because in the end of the day, like, like I said, all roads lead to the same place. So let's just figure out how we're gonna get there in a way that keeps everybody safe and um, is positive. So those are the short-term actions. With the midterm actions, uh, if the breakwaters are feasible, they could be installed. And then you know, going out to 2050, even maybe sooner, a new road could get constructed um, homes could start to get relocated. We were looking this morning at the vacant parcels around the area and maybe some zoning or things that can be moved around to provide areas for homes to be re relocated to and just keep adapting that retreat plan as, as new data comes in and things change. Um, Long-term, you know, going out into the future, the retreat plan will be implemented fully and the beach and bluff will continue to be managed for public access and habitat. So um, I'm just gonna, you know, this this is, this is uh, the same slide, but I wanna leave it up just to kind of hear, I wanna open up for discussion of what your reaction is to these recommendations. Do you agree with some? Do you disagree with others and why? Um, you know, we're not going to solve this today, but there is a date in the future where homeowners will commit to move their homes, where to move. You know, maybe they won't have a coastal view, but is it feasible? And so um, our desired outcome for today is just to get this conversation going in a generative way where we're creating and, and working together to figure out how we can feasibly do these things. Um, it's really time to start flop fighting and, and bickering. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm here in South Florida and we're not allowed to say retreat. So it's a very bad word and it's very refreshing. I think that there's an amazing opportunity here for the community in Nantucket to be brave and to be courageous, you know, to, to be groundbreaking really to say, here's our plan, you know, everybody wanted something different, but we had a reality check and we came together and it's an amazing opportunity that I think, you know, once we've all digested this and accept it, we can move forward and just start hashing out these, uh, these logistics. So with that, I'll, um, I'll open it up to the, to the discussion. Hey, uh, what's the best way to, to run this? Do you want to call on people? Do you want people to raise their digital hand like I did so you can see them? What's the best process? Yeah, I think um, yeah. if we can do raised hands, that would be best. And then if anybody, you know, there's only so many people I can fit on my screen. So if anybody notices somebody who's been waiting a long time, please, uh, please jump in and let me know. Yep. And Kate, um, just remind people how to raise the hand. Yeah, at the very um, bottom of the screen, I think, is there one? I have yeah, the host reactions. version. Yeah, so reactions, you can, um, under your reactions. Yeah. I just also wanted to quickly say, this pathways exercise that we did last time allowed us to understand your preferences. And so I think we all know people's preferences at this point. And what we're really interested in today is um, the work of understanding what's feasible and realistic has been done for the most part. And we kind of want to start working toward this really hard conversation uh, around timelines. 
um, and what could what could be possible. And it's it's hard, um, but try to put yourself kind of in the mindset of the person on the other side and understand that ripping out the geotubes um, doesn't allow people time to think about and all the things you have to do before you move and staying forever is no longer a possibility either. So just kind of be grounding yourself in that reality before providing a comment. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Josh, you wanna go first? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, so I, I have a very mixed uh, reaction to the report. Um, on the one hand, I uh, am happy to see you recognize the, um, that if uh, effectiveness was the criteria, that expanding the existing project would be um, what we should do. Um, that seems to indicate that there are other criteria that aren't about effectiveness. And I think that those really boil down to local politics. <clears throat> um, and I, I, I just don't understand why uh, that seems to be such a focus. Um, to me, I get that this cannot last forever, but forever is a very long time. Um, People can't live forever, and yet we uh, do all kinds of medical procedures that extend life and consider those great victories. I think we have demonstrated with the pilot project on the geotube something that extends life and does no harm to others and is financially feasible. I think you recognize that as well, but you're basically um, uh, overruling the logic of this with some kind of a political calculus that I don't understand. <clears throat> so um, I get that we can't protect, protect for forever, but I think that we should be expanding the geotubes. We should be getting consensus around what the trigger points are for failure. Um, I don't have a problem with saying retreat is what is indicated if it fails but I think that we can agree to disagree on how long the existing geotube system will last. There, there are people who didn't think it would last eight years, which it, it, it already has. Um, maybe it will only last a short amount of additional time, but maybe it'll last a long time. And if it does last a long time, and if it does not hit any of the triggers, and I don't dispute any of your triggers, it should continue. And so the yeah, idea that we're going to be planning to retreat in the midst of something that's working doesn't make any sense to me. I think I hear that, Josh. I know that um, it seems like the, in your perspective, the, the choice here was political, but I, I just want to remind everybody that it kind of acknowledges the current regulatory landscape, including from the state level and the local level at Conservation Commission. But we're here to kind of talk about timelines too. So I think it's important to understand that your perspective is that we could prolong this. I wanna move on to some other comments. I wanna remind everybody, number one, that stakeholders only. So if you're with the stakeholder groups, you can speak and participate. And number two, that we have a ton of people, more people than last time. So I'm gonna try and limit comment time to like just a minute or so um, as we move forward. Um, so David, can you um, state which stakeholder group you are with? Uh, I'm David Kreeble, I'm with the Green Hills. Okay, thank you, David. Good, uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, your report and I appreciate the difficulty of addressing an issue like this. Um, I would like to follow up though on a couple issues. We just heard from Mr. Posner that there was no harm to others. And I think uh, there's a couple things in the report that I think uh, should be addressing harm to others. First of all, um, you know, the report kind of fails to fully consider the effects of either the geotubes or any system on the adjacent and downdrift beaches. Um, 
So I think this came up in original stakeholder meeting, and I think we uh, asked you to incorporate a wide view to look at the adjacent region. And um, I think as a result, you, you know, you focused in on the Baxter Road area, but um, you know, the negative impacts of any project are felt either side and uh, particularly down drift of the system. I would recommend that you include in table two as a key tension, the uh, explicitly the downdrift impacts and the shortfall of mitigation sand. I, I think it's the number one key tension that exists. Um, I think another point would be that um, I think the report fails to fully address uh, sand mitigation issues that I think are also at the heart of this dispute. And um, you know, I, I just note that the emergency order that allowed the geotubes had a very distinct phrase. It said, quote, sand mitigation will be at a rate of 22 linear uh, cubic yards per linear foot. Um, it struck me that the report never used the phrase sand mitigation. And I think that's important. Uh, I think you use terms like dune nourishment and sand nourishment and covering the template. But mitigation has a very specific meaning. In environmental applications, it means that uh, you're going to intend to address negative environmental effects through efforts to prevent or reduce or offset those effects. And in Sconset Bluffs, the Massachusetts DEP required mitigation to offset downdrift erosion. So I would recommend that in your tipping points and in other discussion in the report, you include the shortfall in sand mitigation as a clear tipping point. I think that is the tipping point for the, the Conservation Commission. Um, another point is I think your adaptive management ideas um, uh, need to recognize the negative consequences of the type of adaptive management that's been been uh, proposed. Uh, the adaptive management proposed is really reducing sand placement. And that has clear negative implications for downdrift beaches. Um, and you know, any reduction in sand that short changes the surrounding area is going to have negative consequences. That should be addressed. Yeah, and I think the sand, um, the sand, so I think there wasn't enough data to back up the downdrift impacts necessarily. Adding sand is supposed to address that. There yeah. is um, there is a part a problem um, a, a kind of key tension as you said around the sand mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the recommendations, therefore, is this overall sand sediment budget and to understand. Um, what, well, I, like uh, I have written comments and I'll I'll submit those as well. There is a sediment you. budget in existence, and uh, you know use of that would clearly show that any reduction in sand supply by any structure is going to have downdrift impacts. So I think uh, I agree that we should do a new set of a budget, but there is one that would be nice to include. My last point was going to be on your adaptation pathway. Um, you know, uh, you recommended that the geotube system should be kept in place while other uh, actions are taken. Uh, I'd like to suggest the report should include a very strong statement, though, that if it's kept in place, the sand mitigation must be uh, kept up and must fully meet the requirements because uh, lack of that is the worst possible condition. You know, keeping the system in place and not putting sand is the worst possible outcome uh, of that kind of a scenario. So thank you for taking my comments. I'll submit these in writing uh, so you can spend more time thank with you. them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Emily who's had her hand up for a little while. Thank you very much, Kate. Emily Molden, I am the Executive Director of the Nantucket Land Council. Um, just sort of to be somewhat brief, I just wanted to thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the review and also acknowledge the great amount of work that went into pulling all of this data and information together. I think I primarily would just reiterate some of uh, Dr. Preble's concerns about the um, the report not giving enough consideration to downdrift impacts. I think I also recall from one of the early stakeholder meetings some discussion about what the extent of the impacted area should be that would be considered by the report. And there was some discussion about what was most appropriate and within the scope. But as a result of really limiting it to the Baxter Road area, I think that there's just not enough contemplation around the town's responsibility to the properties and resources beyond Baxter Road. So I would just sort of echo some of those sentiments. 
Um, and then also just raise the, the similar concerns about the adaptive dune nourishment that really has been embraced and included as a, as a recommended um, aspect of um, some of these pathways as it is described in the report as really optimizing that sand budget, as Dr. Kriebel said, the, the land council for many years has been very concerned that that ultimately will result in starvation of the system. And I just didn't feel like the report provided enough of analysis based on the existing sediment budget that we do have for erosion in that area to demonstrate how that would not result in additional impacts to other resources or other properties. So I just wanted to add those points. And I know our consultant, Trey Rufin, is also on and we'll probably have um, some further comments. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I know I have some concerns about prolonging the life of houses and around sand. Um, I wanted to take Jamie's comment at this point. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I just have two questions or um, thoughts that maybe you guys will reflect a little bit on between now and, and the final version of this. And the first is I noticed in uh, one of your charts that you showed um, one of well, the various properties and their proximity to the top of the bluff. And 101 Baxter was shown at 35 feet from the road for the last eight years. And I would just point out that that is protected by the geotube that's in place now. And that was part of the emergency scenario um, that prompted the installation in the first place. And as you know, somebody who's involved in the installation understands how these things are configured with scour aprons below, in between and above the geotubes, when you take this system apart, you're gonna completely disrupt the vegetated base of the bluff and, and you're certainly gonna create some sloughing and some, you know, some some erosion to the top of the bluff at that at that time. And so um, I also just want to point out that when when I try and square this with um, your comment to avoid removal of the system before comprehensive retreat plan is in place. And it says um, plan is in place. And so my thought is that it's one thing to have a plan, but it's another to have that plan implemented because when, when these geotubes get removed that are in place now, if that happens, I think that you're going to immediately lose the road at 101 where it's only 35 feet. I mean, that's almost a certainty. And then at both 93 and 97 Baxter Road, you have structures that are within 10 to 20 feet of the top of bluff. So I would anticipate both of those structures going over if the geotubes were taken out without first you know, relocating them or moving them as well. And so that's one thought and it kind of leads to the, the next thought. I think that you guys have done a really good job identifying and acknowledging that removing the current system would be super problematic to those, to those points. And you made that acknowledgement despite the Conservation Commission's recent um, enforcement order to remove those geotubes that are now in place and, and creating that protection. And so when it came to your recommendation about the expansion of the project, um, I feel like there was um, less willingness perhaps to take a different position from the CONCOM as far as the regulatory landscape. And so by stating that if effectiveness were the only uh, issue, then basically it's a no brainer. And then, you know, you, you referenced the regulatory landscape and I assume that had to do with the CONCOM and not the DP because the DP has overruled the CONCOM on the expansion now on a, on a couple of different occasions. And so I'm just curious why you're happy to, you know, say it would be a mistake to remove them, even though the local board is saying to remove them in this instance, but we're not gonna make this you know, recommendation on the other hand, because of the same local regulatory board's resistance to that. So those are my two questions or things for you guys to just consider as you, um, you know, go into a final version of this. And thanks for letting me speak. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I want to go to Jennifer next. 
Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm Dr. Jen Carberg. I'm a representative on the Coast Resilience Advisory Committee, and I had um, kind of just a few comments on your tipping points and maybe considerations for additional um, tipping points. I would have added to the, the conversation on effectiveness versus potential downdrift uh, impacts, but I think a lot of that's been said already, so hopefully those considerations will go into the, into the plan or into the analysis. But as far as tipping points, I think it would be important to put in a tipping point that looks at not just that uh, sand mitigation becomes uh, more expensive, but that it's not occurring. Um, and so that, that maintenance of the structure, because the loss of that sand, if we're keeping you know, a geotube system in place is, is certainly important and I think changes the relationship around what's happening with the project. So that, that would be a tipping point where other considerations I think need to be taken into effect or adaption of some kind needs to happen. The other tipping point I would wanna put in is failure of moving towards those next steps. You know, so you've really pushed the idea that um, given the landscape, the geotubes should potentially stay in place while we're moving towards plans to move the road. And you know that was the understanding when the emergency order went into place that that was what was actually going to happen, and it didn't. You know, so now we're eight years out from that process where an emergency situation has been put in place, and adaptation for moving the roads and changing and retreating and all that hasn't happened. Um, so the idea that expecting outcomes without you know a, a tipping point in place to to shift. Um, what's happening, I, I think should be important, a discussion of how, how you mitigate that moving forward, how you make that process of when a, a temporary solution is in place, facilitating the next steps. I think that should be part of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's important. And um, I wanted to also note to Jamie, you know, um, ha half of this process was uh, really analyzing these alternatives, but half of it was also listening to the community engagement and the stakeholders. So there are a group of stakeholders that do not want any expansion. Um, so that's part of what goes into this. This is not the only thing. The Conservation Commission decisions are not the only thing, but um, some of these do feed into to these alternatives. Um, I want to go to David Golden next. Uh, thank you. I just had a quick question uh, in connection with one of the slides that was shown. I had not seen before, and it was just flashed up briefly. Your um, relocation of Baxter Road, I think it was phase one and phase two, and included a number of line items. I couldn't tell because it was relatively quickly. Is, is there a line item for the acquisition costs of the properties? It looked like there were a dozen or two dozen homes and a big chunk of the golf course. And I'm just trying to understand on a cost benefit basis what's involved in that relocation. Yeah, let me look at that again. Um, we do have um, money in there for legal fees and documentation, permits and survey. And I do believe the acquisition costs are kind of in some of those percentages. Is that correct, Jen? Yes. Sorry, Kate, couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of acquisition costs, um, we did include acquisitions just for the permanent easement widths. Okay, and that's it. So no, so no takings of property under eminent domain. If I had that right, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I wanted to go to Christy Ferrantella next. Thank you. Um, I'm with the select board. I just first wanted to thank you and your team for working on this. Um, reading the report has been really helpful and kind of outlining the history of this and ways and paths to move forward. Um, and I think Karen kind of said it best that all roads lead to the same place and we really need to find a way um, to kind of compromise and meet in the middle. Um, so thinking about it kind of from the 30,000 foot view, select board policy level, I really like the idea of starting the planning process now for moving the road. And if that has you know, funding opportunities um, through federal funding or infrastructure bill, I think that's something 
that is definitely appealing and then we need to start looking into. Also looking at it from the policy perspective is town resources and staff and our ability to manage a project like this um, does kind of raise a red flag for me. And so I think public private partnerships are the best thing that we can do. And I'm not sure if that's something that we can examine or you know, look into. And I think there's gonna be a lot of concerns about private entities trying to help given how difficult this private public partnership has gone. Um, so I am concerned about that. And then just in terms of short-term actions in this report, as you guys are finalizing it, um, a lot of this I know is done under the assumption that the geotubes were going to stay in place um, and that they shouldn't be removed until a plan is in place. And so given the CONCOM's decision, I'm just wondering kind of what steps need to be taken quickly or you know more urgently and kind of what would be recommended to ensure that the bluff doesn't collapse in the um, stance that it's going to take several years to get plans in place and things moving. And in that time, um, you know, we don't want to see the, the buff, bluff collapse because the geotubes are removed. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, Sarah. Hi, thanks. Um, I did want to point out that Trey has had his hand up for a super long time, but I do have a comment first since you called me. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the questions I had, I'm, I'm a representative on the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee, and um, I appreciate that whatever actions are taken, ultimately, as you say, all roads are leading to some form of retreat and relocating the road is the first step. Um, I am Curious um, to see if, I know this is a separate plan from the Coastal Residency Plan, which is island-wide, but if there can be some discussion or placement around the fact of any mention of the retreat plan is in coordination with other, with the full Coastal Residency Plan. I um, am cautious about in my, in my role and as the select board's role of being island-wide, and this is one neighborhood, and there's gonna be a retreat plan that is going to be necessary in multiple neighborhoods and so we would want there to be kind of equally treated um, so I just wanted that to kind of be put out there so um, I know that overall the plan this particular plan is in conjunction or kind of fit uh, let's see synchronous with the closer resiliency plan but I would like especially the retreat portion to be specifically spelled out because it's obviously a touchy subject Thanks, Sarah. Um, Trey, sorry about that. I'll give you a minute here to, to weigh in. I know we heard from Emily, but I'd love to hear your perspective as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Trey Ruthven, Applied Coastal. I'm here on behalf of Nantucket Land Council. Um, I, I was hoping this report would go a little bit further and kind of look into the analysis or you know some of the questions that have been facing you know CONCOM, uh, or really all of the island for the last couple of decades as we've talked about Sconset uh, and provided some clarity to some of those issues to kind of allow everybody to make some more informed decisions. Uh, we seem to talk about the same issues over and over again. And I had hoped uh, this might have been able to answer some of those questions. Um, the one thing I think would be helpful kind of listening to what everybody said so far is maybe kind of a circling back on your how you're presenting it alternatives relative to cost. Uh, you kind of have sections for each one, uh, implementation costs, maintenance costs, life cycle costs. Uh, the one thing I did kind of quickly uh, after talking to Emily and RJ early on after getting the report is, you know, how does this stack up? And I think this might help uh, everyone kind of look for how to read your roadmap moving forward. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the cost for relocating the road, I think you're at 24 $0.5 million. And that would kind of, I think, take the island to 2100 based on what you had said in your report, you know, kind of quickly looking at what it would take to do that is, you, assuming if you're going to do that, you're going to have a few years where the system would still be in place. Uh, so your cost might rise up to about $36 million, assuming, you know, eight to 10 years to get, you know, uh, roads relocated, paved, ready to go. But if you look at the cost of what it costs to maintain the system overall, you know, to maintain the existing system is $12 million over the next 10 years, the same thing. Uh, if and that's not including any inflation for sand, which we've seen. Uh, if you actually look at your recommendations, which were expanding the uh, geotubes, 
which I've heard different interpretations of here, but it seemed to be in your chart at the end, your costs uh, increased dramatically. I think by 2030, you'd be at about $36 million. And I think you know putting those costs relative to time for each of these alternatives would help the select board, the crack committee, uh, and everyone kind of see where uh, costs factor into how to sustain Nantucket. Uh, and I think that'd be important for the more the island-wide community. Uh, I was a little uh, dismayed, as Dr. Kriebel had said, uh, that you guys didn't identify mitigation throughout the entire report and how that plays in. And really, without kind of some basic understandings of how these play together, uh, I think any analysis out of this is going to be kind of limited. Um, uh, I will send in my comments uh, in writing, and hopefully some of those can be added to the report or uh, you know added to the end, so everyone can have a little bit of perspective on uh, different viewpoints, which I think are going to be important as the island keeps moving forward. Thanks, Trey. Um, I'm going to go to Helmet, and I think what we're um, we're hearing a little bit about um, sand mitigation and talking about downdrift impacts, I think we can, um, I think we can look at that. But what I, what I'm wondering is, um, and I'm going to take Helmut's comment, but I want people to think about it, the sand and, and things like that. When we're talking about timeline for a potential retreat, um, how, how does that impact your, your thoughts around timeline and things like that? Because I think we want to talk about long-term, mid-term, short-term. And so if you think about um, the impacts and, and if we can make a statement, we will, but um, I want to think about timelines here. Um, so Helmet, let's go to your comment. Oh, Helmet. Can you unmute? Yeah, there you can, go. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, but just quickly on the, the adaptive mitigation, the whole idea of adaptive mitigation is to preempt any damage to downhill beaches. Uh, so a, an appropriate engineering-based, science-based uh, assessment of the amount of sand that needs to be delivered to appropriately uh, adapt to big storm years, uh, calm years, et cetera, uh, is clearly assumed to be part of the uh, existing system and any expansion of the system. And so any issues about saying that uh, the expansion proposal or the existing uh, is harmful to neighboring beaches would imply that somehow between the town and us and and by the way, independent third party assessors are screwing up and not doing the right calculations. So that ought to be addressed, but there's, there's no sense in which what we're doing now or what the extension would be would have any negative impact on neighboring beaches. But stepping back, I wonder about, we, there's a lot of, that you've gone through in the way of cost, but in a sense, benefit is not really assessed. Uh, the existing system was designed by one of the major coastal engineering firms of the world, Baird and Company. And the assessment is that it's the, what's in place will take a 100 year storm and have no erosion. Uh, it has taken, we haven't had a 100 year storm, but we've had major storms hit it and there has been no erosion. So the idea, first of all, is to expand the existing system would be to provide protection against the largest storms anybody has experienced, A. B, uh, there's no reason to believe that the existing system would not prevail in the kind of rising sea levels that we're talking about to 2100 of plus five to eight feet. Uh, the Sconset Bluff is 30 to 100 feet or 30 to 90 feet above sea level. Uh, so the existing system extended across the existing uh, eroding toe of the bank can be expected to take a hundred year storm and to be with the geotubes replaced uh, over, they have 20 year plus lifetimes, uh, could be expected to last for decades according to bare 
one of the largest coastal engineering firms in the world. So fair enough, short-term and long-term, but short-term can be measured in decades. Uh, and the, the reward for that is the preservation of a couple hundred year or whatever, 150 year old, couple hundred year, I guess, community uh, along Bass Road. But not just that, as uh, rising sea level and increased storm intensities come along, all of Wisconsin, uh, which is also all on high land, is threatened. So the same idea can be extended to continue to protect and to avoid the, for example, $24 million movement of Baxter Road to say nothing about movements of other roads in the future. So the idea that this is the, would be what would be recommended if effectiveness were the only criterion suggests the benefit is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars and the cost on the other side is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so, I know we'll um, we'll be looking at some of the the broader BCA pieces in the coastal resilience plan, um, but I like the idea that we um, that people need to understand the the benefit as well. Um, I did want to just point out that you would need to continue to expand the geotubes up the bluff to keep up with sea level rise. One last comment is that one, it's reasonable to expect that the local community, local property owners would cover at least half the expense of installing this and maintaining it annually. And I'm guessing that's conservative statement uh, because that's the other side of the hundreds of millions of dollars of savings that I mentioned. It makes a lot of sense for local property owners to spend a lot of money to protect their properties and they would. Thanks, Helmet. Um, I'm going to go to Ian. Can I just remind everybody to just um, repeat which group you are with uh, before you speak? Um, thank you. I'm, I'm a member of CRAC and I'm also a member of CONCOM. And um, I wanted to draw attention to um, several things in your report. And, but also I would, I would like to um, reinforce what Dr. Carbert said, was that this crisis has been eight years in the making since the SOC of 2013, and very little has been done going forward um, to address uh, without uh, he said, she said, um, both Jamie and uh, Josh um, don't seem to want him to take into any uh, the consequences of um, the detrimental environmental effects of hard armoring. And, um, and while Helmut addresses that the geotubes are, are constructed to withstand a, a hundred year storm. Um, when they were first proposed, I asked if they could be two tiers rather than four with a choir um, up against the bluff so that more sand would be available in uh, major storms. And on, from my point of view, that's unfortunate that that wasn't the design because as their own specialists have admitted, only seven cubic yards per linear foot is really available during a storm on the face of the geotubes. And um, after that is removed, then of course we start to see a deficit, which was very apparent with the massive end scar and the two nor'easters back to back and the dipping of the beach. So, but I wanted really to draw your attention, if I may, to um, pages 23 through 27 in your report. And um, under 4.3, environmental, ecological, and habitat considerations. And you, you say um, any erosion of the bluff, when you're talking about removal and retreat, any erosion of the bluff is assumed to be less than what is currently being added by the nourishment program. Um, then you also, that's on page 23, on page 
page 25, beach access may be further impeded by subsequent narrowing of beach, collapse of the bluff, and elimination of additional sand placement on the beach. Page 26, with the removal of the present system, the beach may narrow and not be accessible. And page 27, you say negative impact to emergency access due to the anticipated narrowing of the beach will be um, negatively affected. And the fact is my experience from living right on the bluff at number 99 between 1964 and 1997 was that that was not the case at all. As we watched the natural erosion, um, the, the beach never narrowed. And so I'm not, I'm not sure where, what facts you have to back that up. And I think um, I would hope that you might address that and change um, what I would say is sort of almost a bias there, because I would hope that wouldn't be the case. And it certainly, it, um, it doesn't dovetail with my own um, observations. There are, there are several typos, but perhaps I should um, just send that in. In other words, on page seven, page eight, you refer to 22,000 cubic feet per linear, per, per linear foot when I think you mean 22 cubic yards. Yes, we actually the, that one already. Thank you. <laughs> a few other things have crept in there. So I'll, I'll send you um, my written critique. And thank you very much for the work you've done on this. And, uh, and I, I hope you know, that we have an outcome that uh, is agreeable to all. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, I'm going to go to Mary next. And I know Mary. Um, I know you have some thoughts on this, so please share what, you, what you'd like to share. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm with the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, and I will just repeat that our charge from the select board was to consider the island-wide impact um, for coastal resilience. And so I support the perspective of looking at this in those terms. Um, but I, I wanna offer a personal opinion. And first I wanna point to the move of Sankey Lighthouse. Uh, I, I think that as a community, we got together and said, uh, the lighthouse will be at risk in the future. We don't know when, um, and it's prudent to move it now, uh, now being now several years ago. Um, I think that same analysis should apply to moving Baxter Road. I don't think it's sufficient to say we should begin the planning process or even that we should have shovel ready plans in place. I think it's time to move the road because I think it's clear that at some point in the future, and we don't know when, Baxter Road will uh, be breached by the erosion of the bluff. And I think it's prudent to uh, start that process of actually moving the road, not just having plans in place. Because as, as somebody pointed out, that could be a decade long process before we get to you know, a new surface. And, and I also appreciate that the report suggested a gravel surface rather than an asphalt surface. Um, it's not gonna get easier, it's not gonna get cheaper. Uh, it's something that I think we need to just do. I think it's the town's prudent responsibility to move the road. And I'm gonna say that that is not intended to be connected to the geotubes issue. So I think that's true, whether you expand the geotubes, whether you maintain them or modify them or remove them, I think it's clear that the town needs to move the road. And I appreciate Arcadis pointing that out. Um, I think that's all I want to add on that. Thank you. So that Thanks. was in response to your question about the timeline. Yes, I think that's um, that's good because I think we need to clarify that a bit in the action plan. The intention is that the planning and design begin now and when there's funding in place that the, the, the construction could begin. So it's not, it does not preclude, you know, you have to have all those things lined up, but once they're lined up, you should just go ahead and do that. So we can clarify that a bit more around that recommendation. Um, Matt, I saw your hand up. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, with the Coastal Resiliency. I'm with the Select Board and I don't have a title unless Baker, I don't have a doctor or something, unless Baker is a title, I'm a Baker. So uh, yeah, a couple things. Uh, well, in page 49, we, this cost effective, one of the criteria was, you know, it would have something would happen when it was cost effective, it would go away. You know, I think that has to, we have to know who's determining that. Uh, 
So, you know, who's determining whether it's cost effective? Number one, uh, I'd like to see the amount of sand addressed, you know, and what is appropriate, because that is something that has been argued about one way or the other. I'd love to see, you know, what that should be uh, in there. That's an ideal thing. Uh, when we did the original, you know, going eight back, going back eight years, when we looked at, it was kind of common sense of, you know, because we, we had a lot of talk of how's, when's there enough sand? How do we know? And what we came up with, and this was ConCom, this was Andy and myself and Rick Atherton, we came up with a walkable beach. And, and that to me is sort of, when, when I see these structures and see when they fail, it seems, it seems as though there's no beach in front. Sort of on the North shore, we've got some that have no beach in front, that's a failure. If you put enough sand on it, the sand will move up and down the beach, it'll go where it needs to, but there's still sand in front. And so that, you know, because we didn't know if 22 was the number or, you know, or 14 was the number or 30, no one knew. So that was the, what we use then as a common sense barometer. Uh, you know, maybe there's a better way to do that going forward. But I think that that has been important because any of us could look over and see if there's no beach there. You know, I'm not talking during a huge storm, uh, but just on a normal, uh, in normal course of a day. The other reality is the cost of the of this uh, are, are enormous, and the town's ability to do these uh, do these projects, to oversee them, to get them done. And so we've been fortunate because this has been a public-private partnership that really the private sector has dealt with. In the private, we haven't as a town had to you know, weighed in on this. If in fact, you know, this is given back to the town and or if the town begins to participate here, does that mean we participate everywhere else? You know, there's a misconception that they can just be betterments. They may not be able to just be betterments on this. So I think that, I, I think that we, what we are going, you know, as a select board, we're going to have to, there is a political reality of, you know, what can we afford? When can we afford it? And how do we move forward that I think that the select board, the, the ComCom may not have to deal with it, but we on the select board have to. If the neighbors, you know, if this is a, uh, you know, if, if this is, if we're doing all this all together and it's not adversarial, then I, you know, I think we can do that and move forward and the timeline may not be as quick as some people like, it'll be quicker than others like. If this becomes contentious and we have to, uh, you know, it was a lot of work to negotiate the two easements, you know, for the alternative access on the northern end, and we've lost one of those already. So there's a rea there's going to be a reality time-wise that I think people have to uh, be patient with and understand that we are dealing with. If this is contentious, we're going to have to do a taking takings and fight with people who are upset every single step of the way. You know, so I think that that that, you know, I'm not sure where we as a board end up on it. I think that there should be no harm to anyone else. I think that was an understanding that SBPF and the town proceeded with. I think that was, you know, I think that is hopefully still in place, you know, and, and so I, I it's going to there's going to I'm not I think that what you guys have done is great, but there's some refinement that needs to be done on, on sort of who pays and how do you pay and what you know, and when do we do that? The town is facing hundreds of millions of dollars of expenses, not counting this. And I'm not so sure that, you know, the voters and the, you know, the taxpayers are going to, you know, be ready to pull the trigger on a lot of this. So that's, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think it's worth noting, and Vince, you can uh, weigh in here that I, I do know that a sediment transport study may be forthcoming. Um, island wide or a larger sediment transport study. Um, we are recommending a sediment budget. Um, and our intent with adaptive sand management is really to put the right amount of sand on the beach, not necessarily uh, reduce the, the sediment there. So um, we can further refine some of our statements around sand, but I, I wanted to let, let everyone know um, that that was happening. We have about 30 minutes left. So I know there are some groups that we have not yet heard from. Um, 
Coastal Conservancy, uh, the Civic Association, uh, Sankety Head Golf Club, Mass Audubon. Does anybody want to speak from those groups or offer some thoughts around timelines um, and, and kind of thinking through short, mid and long term? Kate, I, I noticed you had your hand up before and then you disappeared. Yes, I took it down because I thought hearing from some of the scientists was really most important. I just, I'm, but I'm, I'm very glad to hear that a sediment transport study is being recommended. When I read the draft report, I didn't see that and made note of that. And I was glad to see it in one of your slides because you have said right up front in the draft report and Karen, actually said the same thing, that this study is not a comprehensive study of the coastal processes. And for me, that is critical to um, understanding that to me, all the recommendations you've made, whether it's the finding that there's no harm or the finding that even that an extension of the GO2s would be most effective, to me, those recommendations are really questionable without that comprehensive study and it being a broadening of the approach. And um, when Ian spoke about your conclusion that the removal of the geotubes would lead to narrowing of the beaches, that also is contrary to everything I've ever read. And I don't think that those kinds of conclusions in the draft report are really reliable without the kind of comprehensive study that you say this isn't. And frankly, I kind of thought that's what was the purpose of this, but maybe that wasn't within the scope. Um, but the whole question of harm, not just to um, other beaches and private property and beaches, but to the public beaches um, and to the environmental impacts and also the implications, as Sarah said, for the island-wide planning process. And when we think about the costs, as Matt um, is really focused on, and rightly so, it also becomes a question of the prioritization of where are the necessary public funds, whether it's from federal dollars, state dollars, or Nantucket dollars, where, what is the priority going to be? And I think um, without a comprehensive study and without this being understood in the context of the island-wide plan, that there is not going to be an ability to come up with a agreed upon um, plan. And I think the kind of recommendations about not removing the geotubes, expanding the geotubes, that these are all um, not based in um, the science at this point, which you, you've conceded, and that it's premature to make such kinds of conclusions without further study in a sediment transport study and the island-wide plan. Thanks, Kate. Um, I do want to say, you know, the science and the engineering behind the effectiveness of these solutions is solid. There's not, um, we, we know that they are effective. Right, um, but the issue of the harm is not um, addressed in the question of effectiveness. Okay, yes. And so I don't think we specifically said no harm, but I do think that we have looked at um, some of the, the larger reaches up to Sackage Pond and some of those things. And what we can see between the sediment data that was provided to us um, on aerial photographs that really look at um, potential for sediment transport or what's been there, um, we really did not see any indication of this. Um, absent a full sediment transport study, these are some of the things we can we can look at and we can um, clarify what we what we did have in front of us. So we'll do that. Um, is anybody else, Kevin? I see your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin Dale for the Sankety Head Golf Club. I want to thank Arcadis and all of you for your hard work. I think it's very very helpful. I agree with Matt Fee. We should try to work together and get something accomplished. I just want to note for more than five years now, the golf club, Sankey Head Golf Club and Sconta Trust and homeowners at the northern side of Baxter Road have been working on an alternative access, a new road if we need it. So it's not a new thing. It's something we've been working on. We'll continue to work on it. And uh, ultimately we want to 
protect the golf club. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I will let <clears throat> others from our team or Vince weigh in on this as well, but um, we're also uh, closing in on the final report for the CRP. So to some of those comments around how this fits in with the larger island-wide context, um, this has been very, very informative. This process has been almost um, the fact that they were running at the same time, um, stakeholder engagement through the CRP helped to inform this process and the stakeholder engagement here has helped to inform some recommendations in the CRP. What the CRP will lay out is um, the types of potential solutions that can um, go in place across the whole island um, with sequencing of projects um, and when those projects should take place, how they could be funded, how they can be permitted. Um, so you'll most likely see some projects from Sconset um, that are aligned with the recommendations here um, and how that sequencing will fit in. And Vince, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that a bit more. Um, it's not much more to say. Um, the CRP is island-wide and it's taken in a massively broad focus and has been, uh, it looks like it's going to take in some extremely interesting uh, recommendations and solutions uh, going to be in the, I would guess, ballpark of 30, 40 uh, specific recommendations, probably more than that, for all I know, come from it. And they're going to each of the individual projects. Um, and the, by contrast, this is one project, but with significant, pu significant public interest. Um, it has been a bit of a challenge in this. I don't think anyone's going to deny that. But uh, having watched it play out and how the project team have tried to come up with solutions and worried over it and trying to do the best justice possible for the people here in Nantucket, it has been wonderful to see. And one of the personal criteria that I've been hoping to see uh, from the outcomes of this project is that it would fit quite nicely with the, with the CRP to the extent that if it were inserted as a chapter, it wouldn't look out of place. And I'm hope, I'm, I'm, I remain hopeful that that's about how this will work out. Um, th thank you for that, Kate. And is, is there anyone else that needs to comment or um, has any other follow-ups? I see Joanna Roach. Yeah, go ahead, Joanna. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Joanna. I'm on the CRAC committee and also on the finance committee. Um, I just have a couple of comments around how this gets communicated to the public and also really thinking about what Matt said, because this is a really complex information set, right, on all the way around. And I think that Nantucket's had a history when these sorts of things go to town meeting that people who don't fully understand the impact, the cost and the importance of these projects when it's balanced with all the other things that we have to fund, they tend to vote no. And you know, we, we have, I think, an obligation to, to try to make this information as simple and clear as possible so that people who do show up and participate can really understand the impact of their vote. Um, because it's really easy to interpret this as arguing or unnecessary arguing or conflict. And when you strip all of that away, there's actually a very important decision to be made, right? And one that impacts Nantucket in a very significant financial way. And we're coming up against, you know, the two proposition two and a half. There are many other needs in the town. You know, the Coastal Resiliency Committee is going to release their report, you know, sometime in October. And the cost of all these things is staggering, right? It's really, really significant. And so I would just encourage this as it moves towards completion to really think about how this is communicated in a way that people can understand and be able to figure out how does this fit in to the order of operations that the town has to accommodate, right? Thank you. That's Thanks important. Very much. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, Jennifer, I see your hand up. 
Thank you, Kate. Uh, and just real quick, I just had one thought as we were going through all of this discussion and listening to everyone. Uh, and again, I'm on the, the, the CRAC committee and these are the kinds of conversations we're gonna have to have around all areas of the island and thinking about other places on the island where we may have to consider how to have homeowners shift their homes or consider putting in some kind of protection we're going to be having these conversations in other places and i guess one of the things that it it sounds like might be more useful to add more into to as you guys get to the final report is that justification of why you're making a particular you know recommendation so if the justification coming out of this really is let's relocate everything away from the bluff and redo Baxter Road, I feel like there really needs to be a strong step through justification to convince homeowners that that's what needs to happen in that area. And, and on the other side, if it's to put, you know, a large scale protection in that gets expanded, we need to have really strong justification for why that is a really strong, you know, benefit analysis and step through of weighing all of the impacts and the effectiveness at the same time. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Ian. Sorry, uh, thank you. So ju just to build slightly on what Jen just said when talking about impacts, and um, there's, as far as I could tell in your report, there was no mention about the animaculae that are, you know, that the beach is their basic habitat. And, and um, so, that, well, especially down in Florida, where there's been some research on microfauna and mayofauna, it, um, they, they, they're the plankton of the inshore um, feeding, you know, the bottom of the feeding chain. And, uh, and armoring and sand deposition has an effect on them. And so I, I would hope that, that if you're looking at this in the final, report that it, it's not only sediment transport that you look at as being of environmental consequence. Thank you. Thank you. In the last uh, few minutes we have, um, does anybody have thoughts around um, timing, uh, where long, short, and midterm actions fell in, in the report? Um, I do know we heard a lot about the cobble habitat, so I think Ian's comment, um, we, can, we can think about that a little bit more. Um, we've heard a bit about um, bird nesting and migratory birds, but um, in terms of timing uh, and where, where some of these actions fell, if you maybe put aside some of the other technical comments we've received or think about the clarifications we might make around those. Um, is there any, any place that you've come to through either this discussion or reading the memo in terms of uh, those actions that are recommended that feel like they're in the wrong place or feel like they could be doable? I know that's hard. Would you put that slide up again so that we can reference? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think Karen can share that. So again, as with, Mary with suggested, um, with the long, mid, and short term, short, mid, and long term okay. actions, I can't, I'm going backwards. Um, but as Mary suggested, I think one of the clarifications we'll make um, is that really the, the road the road should move as soon as all the pieces are in place for the road to move. That doesn't mean the houses need to move then, but um, planning the road relocation now and then beginning construction of the road as soon as as soon as all those things are in place, right? It falls under this midterm action because it might take a little bit of while, um, but maybe we can really clarify that because that is one of the, the actions that can be taken. Um, any other thoughts around timing? And there may be some people I can't see hands up, sorry. If you have them up. Josh. Uh, 
Uh, Kate, I wonder whether you could clarify how you view these triggers, because this is, I think, an area where, at least theoretically, we should be able to come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I can see uh, other communities and even other groups of homeowners who would say, who would not agree to the triggers that we have agreed to, for example. Um, I could see another community that says, if your beach is based on my uh, bluff washing away, you don't necessarily have a right to wash away my house. Um, we aren't saying that. We have bought into the triggers. Um, <clears throat> what I don't like and what I uh, am concerned about is you seem to be uh, wanting to take actions regardless of whether the triggers are triggered or not. Yes, so let's clarify a few things. Um, Karen, can you go to the, the tipping point slide? So some of these triggers are, as you know, um, Yes, when the road is within 25 feet from the bluff at all points, um, or at any point, sorry. Um, if the maintenance of the installed system, whatever that is, is no longer cost effective, which means you run out of sand, um, you cannot continuously keep up with the sand, um, or sand is way too expensive, right? Um, Removal of the system either by failure, you know, taken out by a storm or by enforcement. Um, and then construction of the road in and of itself might be considered a tipping point, but that alone should really be starting because in, you know, basic resilience and adaptation allows for um, some sort of redundant systems, right? So if we're working on the road that could we know that that's gonna to have to be moved at any point. So at least phase one, we're recommending really beginning to put the, the things in place. And there's a lot that has to happen. Concept design, final design, finding dedicated funding, how it's going to be paid for in perpetuity for maintenance and operations of that road um, and obtaining all the access and easements. Yeah. So the reason why that's being recommended sooner rather than later is because we think it's gonna to have to go in. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. What, what I want, what I would hope you could clarify in your, in your report is that <clears throat> the houses should not have to move as long as these other triggers have not been triggered. If the system is functioning, if it's cost effective, if it isn't causing harm elsewhere, if it's being maintained, um, if the if it's preventing erosion behind uh, the system, then we should keep going. Uh, and who knows how long it'll last? I think that's an area where we can, you know, agree to disagree, and different people might have different estimates about that. But uh, it doesn't really matter if it's working. Keep it working. Why would you take it out? Uh, because you've built a road. Yeah, I can see that point. And I would, would that, that would mean bringing it back into compliance. And is that something? Yeah, it has to, it has to get, it has to get brought back into compliance. We have no problem with that. We have a big dispute about what's the appropriate amount of sand. If, for example, your proposed adaptive sand plan was in the permit, we would be in compliance today. And yeah, I think the houses can stay um, even if the road is built. So there is some some sort of parallel pathways there that may be not clear here. Um, so that's something we can clarify. Uh, thank you. Yes, Deanne. Yes, Kate, thank you. Um, just one thing that has not been discussed is that if the current system um, continues, 
who is going to pay for the maintenance and the monitoring and the mitigation of that? Right now, the private property owners are paying, but they have indicated that they won't pay unless the system is expanded. So are you thinking that the town will pay? Yeah, so I think that's something that needs to be worked out. I, I like Josh, are you guys thinking about doing a CONCOM application for the lower amount of sand if you wanted to move to adaptive management? Is that something you guys would file for? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we we've we've tried to make this clear from the very beginning, and I, I don't know how many times I've done my best to explain it to Deanne, but um, we cannot maintain the pilot project, which is privately funded, without also protecting the ho other homes that are threatened that are currently paying these bills. And, you know, we've said we can't, uh, so it, it doesn't matter whether the uh, sand is adjusted to the appropriate level, that would be nice, but uh, without the expansion, um, we can't keep uh, 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 maintaining the existing pilot project. It can, it can be brought into compliance as part of the appropriate expansion, um, but we're not gonna keep paying for uh, protecting the road and the, the 600 to 800 people a day who walk up and down Baxter Road at the probably the second most visited attraction on the island uh, at the expense of you know 15 or 20 homeowners who um, the town is not protecting. I'm going to let Vince weigh in here as well on this or whatever else you had your hand up for. Uh, uh, thank you very much Kate. Um, I'm just curious if you did bring it back into compliance that would be terrific and then maintained it in compliance for a length of time what would stop um, another application for expansion other than? Um... Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to be speaking too much here, Kate, so I, I, if it's not appropriate for me to answer, I, but I'd love to answer that question. Yeah, I think Which it's is, important to so hear. The reason that we did a pilot project was to be able to show over a couple of years when everyone was worried about the negative impact that would almost certainly happen if we put this project into place, <clears throat> that after a few years, we would be able to demonstrate that it was effective and it was not doing a harm and it would be able to be expanded. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the history of how we got to, from two or three years to eight years, but we're done. Um, we can't keep doing that. This project was fully, was about to be completely in compliance again in January of 2020, even with the permit. It's never, it's never been out of compliance in terms of adding the appropriate amount of sand that gets actually onto the beach in accordance with the permit. The only dispute is how much sand would be on top of the geotubes today, not on the beach. It would be a bigger stockpile. That's the only difference. And no, if we brought it into permit compliance for two or three years, on the basis that somehow uh, 11 years later, <clears throat> uh, people would approve the expanded project when they wouldn't approve it after eight years. No, we're not gonna do that. Thanks, Josh. I think I can take one more right now. We have five minutes left. So I was just gonna go with Dwight who I haven't heard from at all either. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Dr. Dwight Dunk with Epsilon Associates, representative of um, SPPF. And just um, had some big questions, some bigger picture comments about the um, long-term, mid-term in the dollar amounts. <clears throat> um, I apologize, I dropped, jumped on a little late, so hopefully I'm not repeating something. But when I look at the report and at the end, um, I'm not gonna talk about timelines or whatever, but the short-term, mid-term action, the long-term action, understand in this um, plan, the long-term action is um, showing ultimately retreat and removal. The midterm action has 
construction of the um, near shore breakwaters if feasible. However, when we look at tables three and four, we see that the expand the system along shore, which I think that means expand the geotube system is 6 million with the near shore breakwaters being 100 million. And then we have 3 million per year of maintenance for the expanded system. When we look at the town's preferred pathway, which has maintaining the geotube system until about 2050, and then removal of relocation. So if we're looking at removal and relocation within 30 years, the expansion and maintenance for 30 years, which we know protects the toe of the bluff and it protects the bluff, the breakwaters are still need to be studied to determine if they're feasible and effective. Um, construction in 30 years of maintenance is equal to the cost of the breakwaters. So I'm just wondering why the breakwaters were selected as the mid as the midpoint um, near, you know, midterm action rather than expanding the uh, geotubes as the midterm action um, when that's effective and no more in, in the same long-term cost. Thanks, Dwight. I think, and um, others can jump in if, and correct yeah. me. I think part of it is that um, the near shore breakwaters in the long term may actually help with um, building the beach back up once geotubes are removed. So it, if it's a, an option that the town would like to explore um, for the long term, if those breakwaters were in place, they could help with some of the, the sand mitigation for the long term and maintaining that beach. Um, right. But really expansion of the geotubes was sort of seen as something that's just not permittable at this time doesn't mean that it can't be in the future. Um, but just kind of looking through that whole, um, the whole scenario as we've stepped through this since whatever time frame we just got involved, right? It's been, um, it's been clear that it's, it may not be a, a permittable solution. Um, and that has, it has weighed into the considerations here. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll we go ahead. <laughs> We did include that in our presentation earlier, Dwight. Okay, like I said, I apologize. I was a few minutes late, had another commitment, but- um, No worries. You know, uh, Kate, was there someone else? Um, I don't, uh, Ian has his hand up. I have one more minute. Ian, what can you squeeze in in one minute? 30 seconds. I can, thank you. Um, I, I was curious as to where you got the figure $100 million for the break order. If you could break that down, no pun intended, that would be marvelous. But um, I have to say that I'm, I'm puzzled by Mr. Posner's comment that, um, about appropriate amounts of sand because um, SBPF agreed to 22 cubic yards per linear foot. The DEP's SOC 2013 reiterated 22 cubic yards per linear foot. And that's what they were legally obligated to provide. And um, how he can, all I can say is that his mathematics are very different from mine when it comes to, um, to the amount that they're in arrears. And I'm, I'm sorry that I have to bring this up, but I just, I didn't feel, as the Washington Post says, the three and four Pinocchio uh, measurement, I just felt I couldn't let Mr. Posner's comments stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want, I really do want to thank all of you for coming today. We're going to end right on time. Um, we thank you for all your comments. For those of you who were going to submit comments in writing, please do so in the next couple of days because um, we are going to be charging ahead. I don't know if Vince, um, you want to say anything. Just to let the committees adjourn. All right. Uh, so do we need a motion and approval for that? Uh, so for the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, thank you, Ian. Do you have a second? second? Thank you, Jen. Uh, roll call vote, Gary Beller. Uh, agreed. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Matt Fee. Don't know if Matt is still here. Um, Ian Golding. Yes. 
Jen Carper? Aye. Chris McClure? Aye. And Joanna Roach? Aye. Thank you all. We are adjourned. And Mary Longacre, aye. Your motion to adjourn for the select board? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Christy, by roll call, Don Holgate? Aye. Christy Parentella? Aye. Melissa Murphy? Aye. Matt Fee? Jason Bridges, aye. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.